My text is taken from Joshua chapter 5, and I'm reading from verses 1 right through to 12. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Made, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeat Haralot. Now, this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age, when they left Egypt, had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgad to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgad on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year, they, they ate the produce of the land of Canaan. Now, I want to call my topic Resetting for a New Season. Joshua is a great book to hear from the Lord at a time of transition. It tells of God's people, Israel, and the dawning of a new day in their lives. From what we read, the children of Israel, they have spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, 40 years marching around one mountain because of their rebellion. 40 years of God's judgment upon them resulting in the literal wiping out of a whole generation, that generation which came out of Egypt with the exception of two people, Joshua and Caleb. And now they are getting ready to go back to the same place where they had failed God before. So uh, this passage of scripture finds the children of Israel entering the land of Canaan, the promised land, having crossed over the Jordan River, which the Bible says was in flood. Now Moses is dead, and the Lord, um, he has raised up a new leader by the name of Joshua. And God tells Joshua something that Joshua needs to hear. Hear what he says. The same way I was with Moses, the same way I will be with you. If I did it for Moses, Joshua, I'll do it for you. 
And uh, you know what? That's exactly what God did. God opened the Red Sea for Moses and God opened the Jordan River for Joshua. Uh, the children of Israel, they cross over on uh, the, the dry bed of Jordan. The waters close behind them just like it happened at the Red Sea. So here is Israel on the brink of a new day, on the brink of a new season in their walk with the Lord. Uh, they are about to begin their conquest of Canaan. A new chapter is about to be written. A new season in their lives is about to be written. Uh, and, and, and they are about, uh, you know, to walk into the fulfillment uh, of the promises that God had made with their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. So here in our text, Jordan is behind them. They have crossed and uh, Jericho, the city of Jericho is in front uh, and uh, they are now caught. Physically, that is between a river and uh, um, a city that they are about to take. And uh, from Scripture, we are understanding uh, that, uh, you know, God saying, everything I did in the wilderness was to get the children of Israel prepared for what was about to happen in the city of Jericho. So. Here they are, you know, just like you and me right now at the end of 2020, standing in a position of transition, standing in a position of readiness to walk into a new day, to walk into a new season, believing that better was right in front of us, uh, that in this new season, just like Israel, they thought that they would see fulfilled promises, that they would see God's hands at work in their lives, that they would experience mountains being removed. They would see God handle all of their enemies. So here they are on the brink of a new year, a new season, a new day, and uh, you know what? Just like us, they have the audacity to believe that truly the best is ahead of them. And uh, why do they believe that? Because they could look back and uh, see everything that they came through and know that they came through only because it God, uh, it was God. They came through what they came through, and it had to be God, you know. And they also was assured that God did not bring them through all of that to leave them all alone to fend for themselves. Surely, God would honor His word in bringing them into the fulfillment of all of his promises that he had made to their forefather Abraham. See, so surely, surely the best has to be ahead of them. So I came by tonight to talk to somebody here who's been through a hellish 2020. You have been through hell and high water a roller coaster of ups and downs and downs and ups. You have had some hard days and some long nights. You have had some struggles and some disappointments. But God sent me to tell you tonight that he did not bring you through all of that for you to have another body, my friend. Now, I know that you would have said, said amen to, to that because there are still people of faith who believe that God has something better in store for them in this coming year. 
that the best is yet to come. And this is, you know, more than just cliche. This is faith. This is standing in faith in God, believing God for better because God said in his word, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them to us by his spirit. So I am looking at a group of people who are hearing what the Spirit of God is saying today. And we are believing on this New Year's Eve that truly God has something better in store for you and me in 2021. See, and I am saying that if I know God like I know God, that God has been preparing me and has been preparing you through the wilderness of 2020 for what he has in store for us in 2021. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we look at these Israelis. First, they were people of the Lord. Because the Bible tells us that they were loved, they were singled out by Jehovah God for a specific purpose. Secondly, they were also people of the law. So they were people of the Lord. They are, they are people of the law because they were given the law. The only people who God gave his law to on Mount Sinai. And thirdly, they were people, they were about to be people of the land, the land that was promised to them by God throughout the generations, a land flowing with milk and honey. So here in our text, their wanderings, their 40 year wanderings, those years are over, and their, uh, the days for them to uh, possess the land, those days have arrived. But there's a problem. There's a problem. This generation, this generation that has just stepped into the land of promise is a generation of the little ones with Caleb and Joshua, the Bible says, a generation all born in the wilderness. So this generation this generation right now in the promised land, they do not really know Moses. So they do not really know the God of Moses. Moses is God. This generation right now in the promised land, they have no Egyptian experience. They do not know about making bricks without straw and slaving, you know, in the, in the brick kilns of Egypt. They do not know about the ten plagues that God sent um, over Egypt, triggering uh, the deliverance of their mothers and fathers from Pharaoh's tyranny. They do not know of God's miraculous hand in opening the Red Sea and delivering their, their, their parents and from, from Pharaoh's army. See? God had kept the children of Israel and protected them. He had led them. He had fed them. See? But there's a crowd here now in the promised land that does not know or they do not remember. See? There's a new crowd, a new generation that just can't remember. I call it probably selective amnesia or some form of spiritual dementia where they act like they don't know. And when you act like you don't know, your carnality, your worldliness, your flesh, those things turn you off from the things of God. You get further and further away from God. That's why, my friend, Church is not like what it used to be. 
we don't praise God and worship God like we once did, you know, because there is a new crowd in our churches today, a crowd born in the wilderness who do not know anything about the history of their fathers walking with God. See, so they act like they do not know our God. They act like they don't even remember anything at all. See, they can't remember when we, as parents, when we were down and God picked us up. No, they can't remember when we were broke and God paid our bills. They can't remember when we were sick and God healed us. See, I'm talking about a generation that has come into blessings without knowing struggle. They are enjoying the blessings today, and they have never, ever struggled in their life. I'm talking about a generation today, a generation who got too much. We raised them, you know, with too much. See, they got music lessons and and sports and the uh, and they go to ballet classes and they go to the gym all paid by us. They do everything culturally, but spiritually they are anemic because they have come to blessings without struggle. That's the missing generation in our churches today, and if they do appear. They don't know how to praise God like we once did. See, and anybody who comes to blessings without struggle, you know, that person does not really know how to praise God because it is the pain, it is the struggle that really gives you your testimony. So before the children of Israel could possess their land of promise, God says to them, there are some preparations that you have to make. And I want to try to identify about four of them. See, so in our text, they are getting ready to move and take over Jericho, to walk into their promises, but God presses pause for them. He says, before, before you move into this new day, see, God says to uh, Joshua, there are some things that I need from you. I need you to do some things before I release you into the place of fulfilled promise. There are some things, Joshua, that you and these people, they need to do for me. Before the clock strikes 12 tonight, see, before the calendar turns to January 2021, the Lord is saying to us, there are some things that he needs from his children to let him know that we are ready to walk into a new season, to walk into a new place in him. So my brothers and sisters, just as God challenged Israel to prepare to move deeper into the promised land, there are some steps that we also today, we have to take if we want to move deeper with God in 2021. There are, I notice there are some things that we have to do in January that we cannot do in December. Now, if you hang out with me, in this chapter five of Joshua a bit, you will find out the same four things that God told Joshua. See, he says, in order to release us or release them into that place of fulfilled promise, there were about four things that he identified. And the first thing that he told Joshua was concerning the step of consecration. So in our text, God says all the males were to be circumcised. And for those of you who don't know, circumcision is the removal of the foreskin of the penis of the Jewish male child. 
and uh, circumcision is used uh, or was used to identify all male descendants of Abraham as their identity with the Abrahamic covenant. So God was saying, before you move into Jericho, before your new season begins, before your new year begins, before I release you into a place of promise, everyone, everyone needs to be circumcised. See, and God gives instructions as to how to go about doing that in verse 2. So he says this, take some flint stone. Uh, he's talking about a rock here. Smash it and make some shards and uh, use them as knives. In other words, he was saying to Joshua, use broken uh, pieces of the rock to cut off the foreskin of all the men. There was no scalpel. There was no anesthetic. See, God was saying, you've got to go through the painful process recognizing that if you're going to walk into this new place, there's some stuff in your life that you've got to cut off. See, you can't march into my place of promise, God is saying, until you learn to get rid of some things. I'm not going to release you, God says, to where you are going until you learn to cut off some things that need to be cut off in your life. So for the Jew, circumcision is of the foreskin. For us today, the Christian, circumcision, the Bible says, is of the heart. See, Christianity, my friend, is the daily practice of circumcising the heart, cutting away those things that hinder your walk with God. Laying down, the Bible says, every weight and every manner of sin that so easily beset you. Taking up your cross, denying yourself and following Jesus. Choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, it is daily circumcision. And uh, it's the cutting off of anything and everything that stands in the way uh, of your walk with God. Now, I know this is uh, New Year's Eve, and uh, this kind of message does not, you know, go down too well. It's not the kind of message that we want to hear on a night like this. See, we want to hear, well, things like when the praises go up, the blessings come down. We want to hear, well, name it and claim it, believe it and receive it. See, blab it and grab it. We want to hear God will do exceeding abundantly, you know, uh, above all that we can ask or think. That's what we want to hear. See, a convenient Christianity. Easy, easy discipleship, I call it. See, and that's the reason why I believe the prosperity gospel is so popular. And that's the reason why this hyper grace gospel is so popular. See, and, uh, and that's the reason why everybody wants to hear nice, inspirational preaching that tells you how good you are and uh, you can have your best life now because truth be told it demands no sacrifice messages on sin and like what i'm uh, preaching now messages messages on hell on obeying god on holy living on deeper commitment on serious discipleship they are too boring. They just don't cut it because mess messages like that, they are unreal. They are not positive enough. They are, they are not uplifting. And, uh, you know, they are not 
uh, in keeping with the times that we live in right now. But God says, take a flint knife. That's painful, my friend. That's painful. And just as Israel was required to remove a piece of their flesh as a sign of covenant, we also, we must remove from, uh, from our lives anything that stands between us and total surrender. If it does not glorify God, cut it off. If it does not edify the church, cut it off. If it does not make you grow in the Lord, cut it off. See, if it is a desire that does not please God, cut it off. If it is a habit that stops you from growing, cut it off. Now, I don't know, I really don't know who I'm, I'm preaching to right now. But there's some stuff, my friend, that you've got to cut off in this new year. Fear, you've got to cut that off. Doubt, worry, bitterness, uncontrolled anger, unforgiveness, procrastination, whining and complaining. Listen, you've got to cut them all off. All off. You know, it passing, there's this story um, of this woman who is about to board a plane with three uh, big carry-on bags in her hand. So she gets to the, the door to go on to board. I'm sorry, ma'am, the supervisor says, you cannot bring that much luggage on the plane. We have a two-bag carry-on limit, and you've got three. The lady, you know, snap back. I am taking my bags onto the plane. See, I'm taking them. Ma'am, the supervisor says, you are not getting on on that plane until you check one of those bags. So, in anger, she grabs the biggest of the bags with an attitude, and she slams it down on the ground to the supervisor's disgust. And immediately, the supervisor adds, by the way, what's in that bag anyway? The woman replied, my shoes, bag full of shoes. In reply, the supervisor says, ma'am, you ain't going to need those shoes on the plane anyhow. So there's no need for you to carry something you are not going to need for where you are about to go. And so, my friend, God is looking at all the baggage you are carrying out of 2020 and saying, there's some stuff that you've got to cut off because you ain't going to need it where I am taking you. Well, maybe you've got to cut off some people, some family, some friends. I don't know. Because if they are not good, you've got to cut them. If they are not adding to your life, you've got to cut them. If they are not helping you grow, you've got to cut them. If, 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 if they are pulling you away from your walk with God, you've got to cut them. See? It's not easy, I know that. I know that. Because we really want the stuff that makes us feel good. But God says, if you are going to move to something new, there is the pain of cutting away the stuff that stands in the way of your walk with me. So, circumcision then, a physical act, really pointed to a spiritual reality. In the physical, it was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham, and every male Jew identified with the covenant through circumcision. And it was really a statement which said, in order to be uh, 
an active participant in covenant, you had to have some skin in the game and put it like that. And the reason some people don't love God like they ought to love God, and, and some people they don't love church like they ought to love church, is simply because they have no skin in the game. It 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 hasn't cost you anything. And uh, like the generation with Joshua, you enjoy the blessing without knowing the struggle. And uh, my friend, when praise don't cost you anything, that praise is cheap. It's okay. It has to be then orchestrated. It has to be staged. It has to be managed. It has to be choreographed because praise cannot be bought without a sacrifice. That's why the Bible calls it the sacrifice of praise. But some of us, we know the stuff that we have been through to be where we are today. We know where God has brought us from. And that's why we praise God like we do. That's why we praise God so loudly. That's why our worship is so passionate. That's why we give him praise all the time. Hallelujah. So deliver me from folks who praise without sacrifice. Without uh, with no sacrifice. They praise with no sacrifice. Deliver me from folks who come to church with no skin in the game. Because folks like that, folks like that, they are folks who are always complaining. They are always murmuring. They are always griping about something. They are ne never satisfied. They are always fault finding because what Ever stuff that they themselves have, it didn't cost them anything. But the reason why we praise God with such enthusiasm, the reason why we do it like we do, is because we have some skin in the game. See, my praise cost me something. I've gone through pain to get to where I am now. My obedience to God, my friend, did not come cheaply. See, and when you have been through pain and come out on the other side, the only uh, result is that you are so grateful to God that he kept you through it all and that you did not die. So when gratitude fills your heart, there's really no room for the negative thoughts of the flesh. So you've got to cut out some stuff because you're not going to make it in 2021 with a 2020 mentality. You know, I deleted my Facebook account quite a long time ago. Because truly, I didn't realize how many stupid people I knew. Because at the end of the day, when you get through it, all of, uh, of their drama, I'm talking about Facebook, when you count it all up, really, you would have wasted at least 45 minutes daily, 45 minutes every day on stuff which has little or no consequence. See, why, tell me, why do I need a picture of what you cooked in the oven? Just tell me, see? So if you are going to walk with God and you are going to uh, walk into his promises this new year, you've got to consecrate your heart. You've got to clean up your life. You've got to mortify or kill the deeds of the flesh so that you may walk in the light of God. And here's the other thing about identity. See? Ah. Ah, through the act of circumcision uh, in identifying with covenant, God is saying that if you are not engaged in the practice of cutting off stuff now, then you are going to walk into the new season looking like everybody else. 
And God is saying, I'm not sending you into a new place for you to bling there. I'm not ushering you into fulfilled promises in order for you to be politically correct, in order to, 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 be, to walk in a comfortable Christianity and ruffle no feathers. I am not putting you in a place, God says, just for you to look like and act like everybody else. No, 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 no. I need some folks, God is saying, who are unashamedly saved. Some folks who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. See, if you are going to walk into this new season, you've got to come out of the closet with your faith, my friend. Now, look at this. The Bible says that after they were circumcised, they stayed where, where they were until they were healed. And God is saying to you tonight, I cannot release you into the new year of my promises until you are healed of what hurt you. You can't go forward until you have dealt with the stuff that made you bleed yesterday. See, you will not go forward until you acknowledge that you are hurt. Your heart was broken, that hurt. You buried a loved one, see, that hurt. You had to accept that some things that you wanted were not meant to be. That hurt. You were betrayed by someone, you know, close to you probably, and you didn't even see it coming. That hurt. They got ugly with family, and something was said that you still hear in your uh, in your ear even up to today. That hurt. You had to walk away empty-handed from something that you gave your all to, that hurt. Or you left some of the best of you on the table with some someone who couldn't appreciate it, and that hurt. And the Lord is saying to you, you cannot move forward until you acknowledge that you are hurt. My friend, if you know that 2020 has hurt you in some ways and in some places we don't talk about, you just say it to God silently. But say it to him. Get it out. And the Lord is saying to you, you need to sit where you are until you are healed from your hurt. See? January the 1st will come, the new year will dawn, but that does not mean that a new day will start for you, you know. Not until you recognize that you have really got some woundedness in you that you have got to deal with. See? And as long as you deny your hurt, you will never be healed. If you don't deal with your pain, your pain will deal with you. If you do not control your anger, your anger will control you. There's some stuff you need to take time to deal with, my friend. God says, sit still and be healed. Sit still and be healed. Because if you didn't deal with what hurt you, you'll bleed on people who didn't cut you. Yeah? And you'll always, always miss the beauty of what God places at the front of you. So God is saying to you right now, sit still and uh, be healed. So in closing, let me stir the waters just a little. 
I am a little concerned that God is telling the Israelites to sit still, sit still and be healed. When you really look at how they, they are positioned physically and geographically, see? Remember, they are on the other side of the Jordan River. They are between Jordan and the city of Jericho. They are in enemy territory and the enemy is watching them. Now, keep in mind also that this generation that has just crossed into the promised land, they have never fought a battle in their life. They don't know Pharaoh's Egypt. They don't know the Red Sea. They never held a sword in their hand. And here they are. Here they are. Between Jordan and Jericho. Healing from circumcision. And God is saying, sit still and be healed. Now, if the enemy were to attack, there is no better time. This is the most opportune time for uh, Israel to be assaulted by the enemy. Yet God is saying to them, sit still and heal from your hurt. So it begs the question, why would God tell them to, to sit still while the enemy is right around the corner and they are in the most vulnerable position that they could ever be in for an attack from the enemy? So. Here it is, I believe. God was trying to teach them a lesson which really says, fear not, fear not Israel. I will fight your battle. I will fight for you. Israel, you don't have to lift a finger. See? You see, God is saying when you are wounded, and you cannot stand on your own feet. Trust and believe that I am God, he says, and that I know how to fight your battles. So, hear this. I am looking for saints here at Faith Community Church who learned a lesson, who learned some things during 2020 that God truly will fight your battles, that God could handle lying lips, uh, and God could shut down rumor mills, and he could deliver you from your enemies. Is there anybody out there who knows that if you stand still, you will see the salvation of your Lord and your God, Jesus Christ, uh, that Jesus is your battle axe, and he will fight your battles for you. Hallelujah. So finally, God says to them, no more manna, Israel. The manna will stop. And I believe that God says that the manna has stopped because by now, he says to Israel, you ought to know that I will take care of you. By now you ought to know that I will move mountains, that all things will work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose, that if you call on me, I will deliver you. Is there anybody listening to me? You have come to the end of 2020, and there are some things that you just know you just know about God, that he is a good God, that he is a faithful God, that he makes a way where there is no way, no more manna. That he hears and answers prayers and keeps you from all harm and danger, no more manna. That he puts food on your table and heal all your sick sicknesses and all your diseases, no more manna. So God says, if you want to move forward, you've got to cut off some stuff. Also, you've got to take time to heal from what hurt you. No more manna. Those are three I said. There are about four things that we need to learn. And uh, 
<coughs> this is number four. Uh, this generation in the promised land, they have never celebrated Passover. And for those of you who need to be reminded very quickly, the children of Israel in Egypt, they were told by God on the last night uh, before leaving Egypt, they were told to sprinkle the blood of a lamb on the doorposts and on the lintels of their houses because at midnight there would be a, a death angel would pass and uh, when that death angel sees the blood the death angel will pass over that house and then go to the next house and then to the next house and so on and so on so god is saying I want them, therefore, to celebrate Passover in the promised land because every year I want folks to know that some stuff passed over them. Hallelujah. And God is saying to us tonight, why don't you stop and glorify my name for what I have done for you already? That before you march into this new year, stop and glorify my name for what I have already done for you in 2020. Death passed over you. Insanity passed over you. Depression passed over you. Financial heartache passed over you. Sickness passed over you. COVID passed over you. Hallelujah. Is there anybody who can just stop right now and give God praise for what he has already done for us so that we can appreciate what he is going to do for us in 2021. So let's take a moment to thank God for all of his goodness and his mercy, all of that over our lives, over our families, over the past year. We ought to be so thankful because 2020, oh, what a year that has been. But in our land of promise, the manna has stopped. But God is assuring us that we can trust him, we can uh, you know, put our confidence in him that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Hallelujah. So let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we truly do honor you for your faithfulness, especially over our lives and over our families, our homesteads, our job places, our workplaces, our neighborhoods over 2020 and god we move into 2021 with the confidence confidence that you will take care of us you will not you have not taken us through all of that to leave us to leave us all alone to fend for ourselves but god we thank you for the reassurance of holy spirit in our lives confirming your love, confirming your ability to provide for us, uh, confirming, oh God, that we are children of the Most High God. So, Father, as we enter into this new year, strengthen our faith, mighty God. Strengthen our resolve. Strengthen our willingness to obey you. And mighty God, God, expand our capacity to honor you more and more in our lives in greater and greater measure because we anticipate that the best is ahead of us. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah. And we prophesy it done for your honor and glory. Amen and amen and amen. And now, if you would stand and receive the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.
and amen, and amen. God richly bless you. A prosperous and blessed 2021. Hallelujah.